morning to everyone. Of course, so I'm always excited to be among friends and uh, share our contributions and our thoughts. And, uh, but uh, today, my presentation comes with uh, mixed feelings. Clearly after you, all of you, and I uh, heard uh, Andrea's uh, reminiscence this, uh, uh, <clears throat> across uh, George's life. It's of course so uh, the feelings are more mixed, yet still I'm excited to be a friend of uh, George. So I will take a few minutes before diving into the technical part <coughs> of my presentation to talk about George and I. And uh, as opposed to Andrea's recollection, his uh, motto of, uh, of uh, salutation was slightly different. He was actually very careful to say, he was never saying, how are you, my friend? How are you, one of my best friends? One of my best friends. So it was so, in a support two skeletons in the So I go back to George, so I met him at the Army, both of us we serve in the third communication section. But, uh, and even though we actually have roots, both of us in from Augusta, the, the our ancestral houses are in fact in the same street. We reconnected back uh, in the uh, United States when we were graduating, and we share the same vision. The vision of uh, the University of Cyprus, we were thinking how this, uh, how we could contribute to become a success, what as uh, 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 Andrea said, <laughs> to be internationally recognized and be a, a one of the germs of uh, the Cyprus so contribution culture and so on. Uh, uh, of course, he followed the dream in a different way than me. He joined the University of Cyprus back in 1993. I stayed in the United States, but we have never separated. Our path, our collaboration, our friendship uh, uh, lasted uh, until uh, he died, actually. Uh, a week before he died, I was here, and uh, you know, we were planning for our next uh, enterprise about MDM and the EDBT that's going to happen in Cyprus in 2021 and 2022. Nonetheless, the, the peak years of our uh, research collaborations was between 1999 and uh, 2014. We contributed together with Atomic Commit Protocol. We work on web database access and query process. Staff response, staff report, his PhD out of that. Then we talk about mobile agents and finally, the last part of uh, our intense collaboration was Sensor Networks. Panagiotis Andreou was one of the uh, PhD products of that with uh, Dimitris Malipur and so on. We published during that uh, period based on the DPLP 30 papers. Actually, we published more in book chapters, 10 journals, 17 conferences and workshops, plus three, we wrote three editorials about uh, the field of our study. Well, as I already alluded to, we mentored three PhD students, both at Pitt and at the University of Cyprus. So we co chaired many conferences. The more, more known ones was MDM 2005 in Cyprus, HTMS 2011 in Cyprus, 2018 in Cyprus. Cyprus was the, uh, in the map or on the thoughts when we were trying to promote or a conference to organize an event and so on. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, we co-hosted each other during our sabbaticals. Me here in 2008 at the University of Cyprus. He joined me five, uh, four years later at the University of Pittsburgh. We traveled the world together uh, as part of our uh, presentations. And uh, this is actually one of our uh, pictures. As you have heard, he loved athletics. And it was unthinkable to go to Sydney in 1990 1999 and not visit the Olympic Stadium and the Olympic installation of the Olympic 2000, Sydney 2000. So with that uh, thought, let me move to the agenda, the outline of uh, my technical part. Uh, to some extent, this work is a continuation of the sensor networks. So it was the next phase after uh, he started looking into human computer interaction and I continue more into the uh, database data stream processing systems. So basically the outline, I will give a brief uh, introduction to data stream processing for the general audience. Then I will focus on 
three of our latest contributions but they address the three questions that we said to divide to uh, shed or to, uh, to drop or to or distribute so data streams data streams at this point is uh by say is the prevailing form of uh, or data gathering and generation, everybody with the proliferation of the applications or are uh, happy to contribute to uh, data. And these data are high volumes, high velocity, have variability, and it comes from all forms of application, from the traditional stock market financial sector, from the science, from transportation, medicine, may name it, or oh, that is the case. However, when these data are coming in such a big uh, volume, there is also a demand to process them at the same speed and volume in order to make sense out of this data, in order to make uh, predictions, uh, and in order to, or uh, in a timely fashion. And as such, we have this new application of stock trading, social network analysis, market basket analysis, basically online analytics <coughs> is the name of the game at this point. And this game cannot be supported by the traditional database management system. It requires a completely different paradigm. And that paradigm is a complete shift. Instead of storing the data, you store the queries, which are continuously operating on the data as they arrive on the fly, and the answer should be produced in one pass. So there is no time to go back and revisit and reprocess the data. And uh, in fact, this uh, paradigm has become the most prevailing in the last seven years. And you can see that uh, in a number of familiar, I hope by some, uh, vendors are supporting this like uh, Flint, Spark, uh, Zamzar, Kafka, all this. Uh, but however, this has their origins to the prototypes at the university, back uh, in 2000 from Aurora from Brown, the stream from Stanford, Niagara from Wisconsin, Nile, and of course our own Axios system. So in order again to put this uh, online analytics and the continuous queries in context, let me <clears throat> present how this system looks like in high level by showing the uh, organization of the Axios or data stream management system that we built between 2004 and 2012. Basically, what you have, you have the applications which uh, are uh, requiring this online, on the fly processing of the data, mm -hmm. and they are registering queries to do this extraction and ingestion of this uh, information that these applications are uh, required. And these are key analytics queries in the form give me the number of each uh, has tag on tweets in English for the last 30 minutes reported every one minute. So this is a query that says, I want to see how tax are accumulated, what is the trend of the tax, and I can follow that within the what we call the window of uh, 30 minutes that shifts every one minute. Once this such query is submitted, among others, the query processor or kicks in, it optimizes them into a network of operators where the streams, the tuples, are arriving and they are uh, flow within this uh, operator network. And this operator network actually is controlled by a scheduler which decides which of these operators will be the best, the most beneficial to uh, given the CPU to process in order to meet the uh, delayed target requirements of the application. And of course, you can achieve that with the help of the load manager. So that is basically how, in high level, a data stream management system you have. You submit your continuous queries, analytics, or otherwise, that optimize, you attach the input streams that you want to process, possibly the blue is the English, and the red is the German tweets, and then, in our example, and then as they flow within the network, they will produce the output to be directed to the appropriate stream processing application. For another example, you can think that who might be interested in this is Afina, who is interested in 
making money by following the trends as things are happening in the stock market and how these potentially are, uh, are reflected in the value streets. And in that case, she comes up with the analytics query that I mentioned before, submits that, and then to the stream processing engine that will ingest all these tweets as they are arriving to produce analytics graphs that uh, will provide her with the idea how to proceed and invest uh, and make money, for example. And the way that uh, that query that I read before in a in a SQL like uh, form is select the hashtag count a total link from the tweets range equals 30 minutes slide one that is the window operator where language is English USA group by hashtags. So that is basically how Athena will an end user will uh, submit the queries. Now the stream pressing uh, engine, what it's going to do will accept the SQL and will convert it what we call the logical plot. Will be the steps, those operators that I highlighted in the previous slide, that says this is the input stream, this is the window operator that will monitor and control this uh, production of, of uh, results. And then we have the actual function that will do the aggregation in our example before was the count. However, in reality, this is mapped into the physical plan where is the architecture of your computer. Depending on what architecture you might have, then you might uh, take advantage of the parallelism and start executing these queries in parallel. So this operator, for example, if you have four uh, core system or four CPUs available, whatever that might be, when the tweets come, you add an additional operator in order to distribute the load across the workers that operate in parallel to produce the result. So that is what is how the system in the low level works. So if we go back to our real example with Athena, so Athena said I'm interested in this group aggregation based on the hashtag, and the hashtag I can be used as a key so that I will use it as my criterion for partition, for distributing the streams across my workers. In, in, if I have this for core CPU, then I will say I will put the partition one core, I utilize two other cores for the process, and then I still need to merge to reduce these results into the final uh, result, so I will need another uh, process. And this is how it's going to look like in reality in the for the partition, the input, this is the partition in the input for the computation, the final reduction computation, the production of the result. So in order to complete this uh, primer, it's uh, required, I think, to show you how these so-called state uh, operators that they maintain the state over a period of window in order to carry the computation and produce a result, uh, functions, execute. So basically in this simple example here, we are assuming that you have these windows of, uh, <coughs> uh, of uh, five, the range, and then uh, we slide every 10. So what we would like to do, we see these uh, inputs are coming. This is my uh, input stream at the partitioner. They will collect this data until such time that uh, the time 10 arrives which says, okay, this window should close. So by closing between five and 10, that is my range, I can produce and send these so-called watermarkers into the different workers in order to initiate their own execution, compute the aggregation. So in this, so the first step, when they receive that, they each and every worker will collect all the tuples that have already arrived throw out the ones that they are not falling within the window that needs to, or the, over which you have to carry out the computation, and then process the results, then emit it, produce it to be shared. So in this case, this processor makes the X, this is the Y results, and then it, uh, and the T2 and T3 timestamp uh, tables are out of range, so they are uh, discounted. 
So that I hope I gave you some good feel how these things work and in the lower level. So now let's see how things work again one step back. Athena sent her submit her query and she put also a requirement besides the window over which the results will be computed. Also, she is interested in getting the results as everyone in the response time or the delay target will be one minute. So what could go wrong? As long as these results are produced <coughs> by the different workers in 34 or 25 milliseconds, things are fine. But workloads change over time. And this is the nature of the data streams, the variability, the first that could kick in, in which case, actually now we see some skewness happening with respect to this computation. And the issue that now the data stream processing systems have to do is, how do I deal with that in order to meet Athena's delay target? So one idea is uh, to parallelize more, to partition better. Then maybe as the time progresses, things becomes even worse. So not only we are missing one deadline, actually everybody is well above the delay target. How the system should react? So the two options that the system can have is either to shed some load in order to be able to cope with the remaining one or to scale out. Ask for an additional help, add some more extra uh, hardware. And this exactly where brings me back to my uh, pattern. Now the system has to make a choice of divide, to drop, or to distribute. And in the rest, uh, I will provide answers to this as we have contributed them uh, in the last uh, one and a half year. So <clears throat> if it was a, uh, uh, the way that I prepared this originally was in the form of tutorial because that was what we talked with uh, uh, Dimitris. So it, uh, I allowed some space for questions. If you have questions, please interrupt me. I'm a teacher, so academician, so it's okay. So if you have questions, please ask me. So, uh, so I will talk about the aggregation-driven partitioning that uh, uh, we claim that is a state of the art to deal with the problem of uh, divide. So again, to bring the problem into context, we have this parallel stream processing engines that I talked about, that you have a lot of workers to deal with. Then you have the partitioner that has to make a decision how to divide the load across these available workers in order to meet the uh, delay target. And uh, <clears throat> the problem that we have identified, the current state of the art, was that they focus only on the balance. So basically, they use the intuitive way, or the intuition, I should say, that if I give the same number of tables to each and every worker to process, then the result will be balanced out. We have exactly uh, what we are expecting to have. But uh, actually, what it turns out is that all these methods ignore the third component that I tried to show or hinted on when I show you this mapping into a four core CPU, still you have an aggregator, a reduction step that combines all these other workers' partial work in order to produce the final aggregation. So as long as you focus on the partial aggregation, the first part, things are good. But if you go to the final aggregation, then you need to consider the cost and the overhead of the aggregation. So, Again, in order to illustrate this by uh, visually, you have the partition, the load could be partitioned and processed. This is a partial aggregation. And then here is the uh, final aggregator, the final step. All the current methods ignore, ignore this uh, cost here. And in order to put this in a formal method to drive our uh, optimization, we will use the uh, absolute values of uh, worker I to say how many tuples were sent to this worker I, whereas the double uh, normalization will be the number of distinct keys sent to the, this particular worker sub I, 
which is the cardinality, how much different uh, aggregation this work has to carry out. Okay, so with this, let's uh, go to this uh, travel of the options. So the, ob the first option, if I ask you how you could achieve this, you would say round robin, it's called also shuffling. This is great, it's very cheap. Tuples come, and then I will give one to F1, one to F2, one to F1, one to two, and in fact, this is exactly what my animation does, and everything will be balanced out. Great. But as I already alluded, the balance load is achieved, but this cost of merging the partial <coughs> into a final aggregation is ignored. So you might say, oh, I have a better idea in order to overcome that. Why don't I use hashing? So I will use hashing, and then what I'm going to do is that based on the um, Based on the on the color of the keys, I will send only without any. Uh, oh, this is the wrong one. Sorry. So this will uh, not get mixed group aggregations and distributed across the different workers. All the workers will see exactly the same keys. They will carry the same aggregation only once, which means that when they produce the result, you don't need a final aggregator to merge them and produce the uh, result. It can be transmitted directly from the workers. That's great, no aggregation cost. But clearly, as my example shows here, it's in balance. So the F2 is overloaded because of the skewness of the keys, as opposed to F1 that basically sits and burns cycles without contributing to the result. So, between the many choices and one choice, there was uh, lately another uh, scheme that uh, is considered actually the best uh, approach is uh, that tries to bridge the partition trade-off between the balance and the aggregation cost. And that was the so-called PK. Actually, one of the uh, designers of PK is from Cyprus. And, uh, <clears throat> So what they said, okay, instead of using one hash function, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use multiple hash functions. And after uh, using that multiple hash functions, I will pick out of the results of those, the working with the minimal load. So in that case, what I'm going to do, I'm going to basically, say, let's say this example, the K comes, die hash, with H1, it says work in one, with H2, work in two, oh, both of them are competing. I will see which one of the two workers have the least load, and I will send that in order to achieve this balance. So basically, I try to overcome the skewness that we saw with the single hash function. Yet, still, you have the aggregation cost. The aggregation cost has not been solved. And here, where we come. So, in order to measure this, the uh, PK group, basically in the ICD 50 papers, they propose that I will me measure in balance as the difference from the load of the maximum worker to the average load across all workers. So I will define that as my uh, in balance. So in this example here, the balance is 0.66. Uh, if you do the calculation, for the interest of time, let me move on. And uh, then we came with the idea of the aggregation metric. So the aggregation metric for us is how can we measure how much extra work you have to carry out as a group by uh, steps. So the way that we said is that uh, basically we're going to find the sum of all the distinct aggregation steps that have to be carried out across all workers after you do the partition. So in this example here, there are two distinct groups in the worker one, uh, one in the worker two, two in the worker three, so the sum of distinct aggregation steps that needs to be carried out is five. So what we want to do in our model now is to balance the two. 
So we want to minimize the imbalance, which is the first intuition of our colleagues in their previous proposals, while at the same time we want to minimize the number of distinct aggregations. We want to be much less than if you spread everything across all sites as would have been the random or the round robin. And uh, <clears throat> so in order to achieve that, it, we need to keep track of each worker's cardinality. And here is exactly the challenge. So far you might say, oh, this is impediment is how you can really move from the more theoretical into the actual operational. And that is the, uh, the problem we had, we got stuck for some time. So basically we said what we need to do, the partitioner needs to have a good estimator for the cardinalities across the distribution of cardinality across the workers. So you can say that if we provide to the partitioner this uh, API which says, uh, I, I will uh, submit a key and then I will get the answer for a particular worker which is uh, containing that worker. And also what would be the estimation for that uh, key if it doesn't exist and then I perform an attack, then this will actually allow me to keep track of uh, how the uh, group buys are distributed across the workers. And you might say the obvious set is given a set structure for each worker that you keep track counting these uh, aggregations. However, that is not feasible. There are a lot of uh, you in the core space, it requires speed. So what we wanted to do is to come up with a way that we can achieve that in a minimum possible low space, possibly at the cost of accuracy. And uh, during our investigation, we came across this uh, 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 sketch scheme, which is called carbon lock lock. And uh, basically it has the minimum lock uh, memory cost from all the other uh, sketches that we came across. And uh, however, the problem with that is that uh, it's not uh, reversible. So the idea of that uh, is that uh, when you get your value, you hash it, you utilize some part of the low uh, significant bits to map them into a hash structure. And then using the harmonic mean of the packets values, mm -hmm. you can say whether that particular, uh, that would be the answer of how many approximately uh, 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 group buys exist in that particular worker. So, as I already mentioned, there is no, it is not uh, inversible, this uh, function. So, it does not support the contents. If I ask key three, does it contain the worker one? The system cannot, the hyper lock lock cannot provide me with that. So, we said, okay, let's play a game. So, I will. Uh, make an estimate based on the existing, what is the current number of group buys in that particular worker one? And it will be three. Then I will get the new key and I will try to put it there as a guess and then I ask, so how many keys do I have now after you carried out this uh, estimation? If the difference between the estimate and the trial is zero, it means that this key exists there. It found it. Otherwise, you return false. So with this, the trick, we were able, in fact, to come up with a very tight uh, uh, implementation of this idea of keeping track of the group bias and utilize it in order to make decisions for partition. So based on that, we created these uh, uh, variations of end choices that uh, uh, basically try to balance low, uh, load balance and the group uh, uh, cost. And uh, basically, <clears throat> I will uh, give you some feel of each and every one of those. So the first one is uh, <clears throat> the cardinality imbalance minimization, which uh, if you think about it is similar to the one that instead of minimizing the load, you minimize the imbalance with respect to the group bias. So you get these different choices as it was the PK, you find out which group is less loaded with uh, group by operations and then you submit that 
uh, new tablet into that uh, workload. So in this case, the, the least one was the third one. So if you cut down the computation, you say now the L3 will be the cost in the W3, so it gets the new part. Sorry, it was here, I skipped one. So it goes to uh, W3. So the next one was what we call the load imbalance minimization. Again, this plays the game between the minimum load and the minimum group I, and with some probability. And let's say the probability is 0 0.5. I again play the same game with multiple uh, hash functions. I get uh, W2 and W3 as potential workers. I carry the computation with respect to their group by load and the tuple load. And uh, based on that, I found the L, which is the combined load in order to make decision where to send this new or K that arrived. And in this case, again, the W3, it has the lowest L value, load value. So I will submit this new K value to W3. Uh, then we move on and say, okay, we learned from our past experience that if you try to keep track affinity, send the same key into the same workers as it was the hash function before, it actually might improve the performance, minimize the cost of the aggregator. So we came with this uh, idea of uh, if it contains this particular Q, K, uh, worker, we send it there. Otherwise, we're going to find which worker has the minimum load to submit it. And in this case here, again, we did uh, the same. K arrives, find the workers that potentially can receive it. You say whether it contains it or not. If it contains it, in the case of W1, that is where this Q, Q new double is uh, submitted for execution. And finally, is this uh, count affinity in balance minimization. We are basically, again, we try to do a better balance between the load the affinity and the uh, cost of aggregation. So when a K shows up, we will send it to a worker that has already seen that and is processing this particular uh, key. Otherwise, we're going to find the worker with the minimal group by operations and, uh, and load in order to uh, process. And again, we get these numbers that I have already mentioned. So basically in summary, we recognize that uh, the cost of aggregation needs to be taken into consideration when you are trying to partition. And we came with four different variations how this could be utilized. And we carried experiments in order to see what, which of all these four choices are the more promising. And if indeed they are beating the state of the art the KK algorithm. So we ran the, uh, the first. Uh, <clears throat> We ran the performance for the throughput, uh, and it's, uh, we measured it uh, uh, gigabits per second. We used the TCPH uh, uh, data uh, uh, benchmark, and uh, we use actually the query three, which has 110k thousand groups, joins, and group by. So it's a heavy load. And if you can see from this, uh, our schemes, all of them with the variations are uh, scaling much better with the number of uh, workers. And uh, in fact, the AM and the CM, this affinity and the cost affinity show the minimal aggregation overhead and balance load effectively. And in fact, uh, it's up to one order of magnitude better than the PK, the current standard now. Uh, yes, go. Just to get a little bit lost, if you have to pay a bit to do the better prediction or the better probability in the other scheme. Yeah, actually we use uh, the, we, you mean the other scheme with respect to the 0 yeah. 0.5, our yeah. five, yes, we play that. Uh, yeah. and, but the results here is all of them with 0 0.5, okay. the ones that uh, I showed. Good question. So we did uh, the same thing with the window latency, how much we take to process a window, and this is in milliseconds. And uh, <clears throat> again, if you see from the graphs, and then uh, this the standard deviation, we will see that uh, using the DEPS 2005 competition data, use the two most heavy queries, Q1 and Q2, 
then the special crypto that has joined group by count and media then we have seen that uh, our two schemes AM and CM outperformed the PK by up to 11.6x and the fit which is the hash up to 1.9x so these are the promising results we also see how it scales again if for the interest of time we will see that the AM and CM are scalable and maintain at least 1.3 better latency compared to the PK so this is exactly what we have to offer and uh, as I said that uh, we have this holistic partition model that takes all the costs into consideration we provide these four different algorithms uh, this contribution of playing with the Harvard lock lock sketch turns out to be very beneficial and the insight that uh, we gain is that the low imbalance does not necessarily mean low aggregation cost this was like our hypothesis that we have shown actually that is the case with our uh, four algorithms so <clears throat> the next uh, topic is the constant uh, driven uh, load shedding this has to do with the drop so again just to remind you the context what could go wrong at some point Athena requires one minute response time the system tries but it can fail to deliver so what it's going to try to do is either to scale or to shed shed is the first course of action because so scale out is very expensive so if we go back to the load shedding schemes that previous people now propose if you go and see how things change if you have the original data the normal exact processing it means that all these tables will be distributed partitioned across the workers in some fashion and the, all of them will be considered as part of the result in the case of load shedding some of them will be dropped in some fashion and you will come up with some approximate processing and if you don't do this dropping very carefully you might get into the very surprising situation that actually some tables are lost completely so basically you lose significant information so now this load shedding means it has to be done very carefully and uh, not to lose exactly the distribution of data so you might say okay I know how to do that uh, in the past uh, people proposed to utilize the utility so basically for each and every table or category type of table I will add a utility and the ones that they have low utility throw them out I'm not interested in it for them so that sounds good however let's say take example of the bus routes you cannot predict and come up with the utility online and say oh now the 61 C is is of no interest throw it out so somehow this idea of exploring these patterns that they're expressing with some utility function is not applicable within the data stream management system it used to be good for uh, database systems with store data but not on the fly processing of data so what we have learned out of this is if you explore the utility of tables you know whether it's important or not that is a good idea can we do that so we went to another related work and we said oh these guys they say what I'm going to do, I'm going to use historical properties, the histograms that we use for query optimization in traditional database systems. And then, based on that, I will utilize this, I will come up with that utility function that is going to be captured as part of my histogram. And then I will use the histograms to throw out the tables that I don't need. Sounds good. However, the properties might be outdated, or this is in the past. Now, my morning and evening traffic for example has completely different patterns and it changes from day to day it's a weekend or not it's a wednesday that there is a game and everything towards the stadiums are packed so this doesn't work either but still if we are able to explore the utility that we have learned from previous for every window on the particular time we're in good shape so how can we do that and this is exactly where we came we said that uh, <clears throat> if i'm able to 
come up with a window with this information here. And this is my original data. Then my goal is to do some load shedding without losing important data. Then I have to come up with a method to come up with a, some stratified sample that this sample will capture the analogy of the importance of the existing couple. And then I use the stratified sample to do the load shedding. So that is exactly how you translate the problem. And now this is what we mean. So given a particular operation, we want to see what is this stratified sampling that will be useful in order to come up with the correct answer. And that is exactly the concept. So for each and every operation, you have to come up with some description of the study sample that we call concept, the new concept, that you can utilize in order to do load shedding. And if you go back to your statistics as well as approximate continuous query, uh, sorry, approximate query processing, you will see that actually for aggregations, the window concept, if you find the mean and the standard deviation, you can come up with a good way to come up with a stratified sampling. Uh, uh, whereas in group by and join, the group frequency is the one that better describes and drives the uh, stratified sampling. So based on this concept, I do sampling rate, I do group sampling rate, or I do matching groups based on the operations in order to come up with appropriate stratified uh, sample. Good, bad stories. Because in order to do that, you have to scan each window twice. Do you remember my beginning slide? One pass? So this is a problem. Hmm, but do you remember my second slide that I tried to educate you how you process the state operators? Do you remember that guy that actually is collecting that tables and sees them and then it's going to generate basically the watermark for this to be processed. I can utilize that period where I'm collecting the tuples to decide whether to add a tuple into a sample or not and then process it further in order to generate the, uh, the, the uh, shedding as part of the second step where I say I will collect all the data through the expiry ones and so on, instead of the expiring ones and the ones that don't need for my calculation. So how it works, basically, when the tables arrive, let me go one step back, the six is uh, put in, in, into unified sample across all windows, so six fits into both of these. And then when the watermark comes, says, okay, which one should I process? And then you say, I'm going to press T3, T5, T6. Then out of my appropriate concept, T5 is not important. So I throw it out and I operate on T5 and T6 to produce the result. So now I maintain my one pass requirement by utilizing the buffering while you're buffering, I am computing effectively. No additional scans, control memory overhead. So all these are good. And the good story is that we have shown through a real experimentation over Apache Storm running on the uh, Amazon uh, cloud, the, how this actually could be readily implemented and utilized in a real system. So we have uh, uh, used three data sets from DEC, the, uh, other word, the, the DEPS, and these have different operations and different uh, window size and means in order to stress the system and see whether actually we get uh, what we were uh, hoping for. Storm, we have the exact pricing with the absolute truth. Uniform load shedding with a, a shed by S is the current state of the art. All, the, all these uh, <coughs> uh, stream pricing engines use that for load shedding. And then we have our own concept driven uh, load shedder where we have the budget for the memory to be B1 minus S of the budget of the sampling, the input sampling. Here are some results, scalability. We measure the mean and the 95 uh, percentile of the window processing time. This way is measured in milliseconds. And you can clearly see that the storm, the uniform, the code, 
the uh, process of uniform encoding with respect to the performance scalability of the current state is similar. However, <clears throat> if you start for putting more load with respect to the other uh, 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 load, the other, uh, sorry, the other uh, data sets, we would see actually things deviates a little bit and we say the takeaway is code is at least four times faster than the normal execution and scales much uh, better than the uh, norm. And then we say, okay, that is good. This is, is the safety feature, but do we really gain something? And the answer is, uh, is, the answer is yes. We measure the total time of execution. Here is the storm and here is uh, the concept driven the 95 percentile, percentile. And then you will see that uh, uh, again, we have 2.2x uh, faster compared to the exact computation. So we can carry out much more work with uh, less uh, uh, cost in uh, 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 in error. In error, how do you measure the error? Oh, here is the error. So there, basically, we did this last experiment where we use the depth uh, gain data set and uh, we use a uh, group by user-defined functions and we try to set 98%, 90%, 75%, 50% to see if you move aggressively, what would be the cost in error. And uh, we compared our concept even with the uniform, which again, I'm repeating myself, is the current standard implemented in all these uh, stream uh, processing engines. And as you will see here, the mean relative error percentage uh, with respect to the data process. So the code, when you have very uh, uh, little uh, percentage, that means 95, 98% drop, it has about 10% error, whereas it uh, or <clears throat> dives into particular zero error as opposed to the uniform that basically is way, way unpredictable. So with this, uh, uh, well, this uh, concludes my second part. Very quickly, let me bring Unimico. Unimico is uh, the uninterruptible migration of continuous queries. Again, let me put things into context. What could go wrong? We said that if you have extremely overloaded situations, burstiness in the data, the values are extremely skewed, everything is the perfect storm. What do you do? Do you bring the system down? You say, no, I'm going to scale up. I will distribute. But that is very expensive. And if you have all these states to migrate, the migration will take much more time. And during the migration period, the worst part is that the system cannot perform. So now this delay target cannot be met. So we have to address that issue. So we came with this uh, Unimico that uh, basically never interrupts the processing, the processing continues, or it operates on joint segregations like window or semantics are taken into consideration in order to somehow synchronize the continuous query in the origin and in the target. At some point, both of them work at the same time, but only one of the two produces results. And when the synchronization point comes, then there is the handoff from the origin originating to the target node to continue processing. So this is lightweight, minimal computation and network cost. So let me give you the, the main idea in a high level. So here is our uh, uh, stream. We have windows of range four, and we have a slide of one every uh, minute you slide. So here is the first window where this is operated on the uh, original uh, node. Then you have the window two starts after the slide of two. Then let's say that the first tuple will be read by the target is this, because now there is a signal in three says you have to migrate, I'm overloading. So now, if I redirect and split the stream between the origin and the target, then both of them will see from this point of the <coughs> same input, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now, you cannot immediately fall over to the target because the target does not have a complete state of a window. 
So what we need to do is to delay it some time to build the state. And once the complete state is built at the target, the target state takes over. So, so this, this, will, this first window will produce by the origin. It has the complete information. The W2 that started, the, the, the target does not have three. So it has four, five, and six. So the origin still needs to process and, uh, and produce the result of W2 because it has a complete state. But next, when the W3 starts, the, uh, the complete state is also constructed at the target. Now it has four or five, five, uh, uh, five, six, seven, and eight. So from that point on, this will be the first window produced at the target, and the origin will stop at uh, producing the W2, and that is complete the migration. So that was basically the idea, and all this trick can be achieved by computing this migration timestamp that basically tests both the origin and the uh, uh, target, where there is the first part of the state that they can be constructed, then they know whether they have completed uh, state or not. Basically, we have computed this, we came up with functions, and uh, this actually can be applied even with multiple windows within a query, join, followed by an aggregation, and so on. And uh, basically, we show that actually this works through an implementation in the Axios prototype. We measure correctness and response time. We uh, stress the system with these uh, three representative queries, which is a binary join, aggregation, time-based binary join, followed by an aggregation. And uh, the results of that, <clears throat> if we want to summarize, this is exactly what was the output with the migration, the output without the migration. So you see how this, there is a fallover at some point. This is the red. It shows how the response time variability at the, with migration without migration. And of course, you might say to me, this is not a clear uh, view. Let me summarize for you. And here is exactly the summary of uh, the performance. The mean response time across this for query one, for query two, for query three, indistinguishable. There is very small microsecond Hand off period, but then it works very well. So, in summary, steam processing is challenging. That's why we love it. It's uh, my main uh, focus at this point. And it needs to be adaptive because that is the reality of the workloads. If you want to follow the workloads in real time, make predictions, decisions in real time that have impact, you have to be adaptive. So in this effort, what we look into, the first one was the partition, distribute the load across uh, the available uh, hardware that you can utilize computational power that you can utilize. It's lightweight, it's resource constrained in some respect, but it's also data dependent based on our contribution of the holistic model. Then we have uh, the load shedding as the second line of defense which again said light load, is resource constrained as already mentioned to you that you have to come up with this prediction of the concept and come up with the stratified sampling in order to utilize it to perform the drop. And also it's data dependent, the concept itself is data dependent. And then we have the scale out, distribute. It's data dependent, doesn't matter. It's resource unconstrained, but it's heavy weight extremely heavy weight, in spite of our effort with the Unimico to minimize it. And uh, <clears throat> when we try to put and understand where our contributions fit, you can always go to back to the Venn diagram and you see this distribution. This is uh, the, drop, the drop and this is the division. However, there are these overlaps. So Venn diagram you say, can I utilize these spaces come up with new algorithms that actually will offer better uh, performance with respect to uh, this uh, things. Combined partition with load shedding. Combined load shedding with scale out. This is our current and future goal. 
So this is something that we're looking at. Of course, this work is uh, needs to be credited to your co-authors and collaborators. This uh, work was produced to PhDs. Big Katsibulakis uh, <clears throat> has just joined Amazon, and Sal uh, Fa. She is the query. Uh, she's the ma pro project manager at Vertica for Query and Analytics in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And this is my co-director of the Advanced Data Management Technology Lab, Alex Lambrinidis. Of course, I have to say goodbye, my good friend. I will never forget you. Thank you all. Questions? <laughs>